Last week on Ghost Hampton, Lyle signed the exclusive deal with Fearcom to get next to Silk. When he tells Flo of Georgie's looming threat, she dissects it accurately. In the morning, Lyle will leave home with Silk's team. First, he's shocked when a kindly old man appears in his kitchen. Then Georgie calls. She's already enduring sexual harassment at work due to his ghost story. Lyle Hall is unable to sleep. All that excitement outside. Dread for his daughter Georgie and how he cannot share his fears with her. Thoughts of his strange new contract with Fear Con. And Jules' heartbreaking face. Lyle cannot get her out of his mind. Wide awake, he decides to try Linda, the techie cop who does police sketches of alleged perps. Unsurprisingly, Linda, young and unmarried, is awake after midnight and picks up. The two sniff each other's butts for a minute while Linda takes the measure of this man, the father of Detective Georgie Hall. One thing he makes clear right off is, Lyle must never tell anyone Linda drew Jewel, especially for $200, especially using police department software, ghost or not. It's unsettling that Linda already knows about the ghost girl. Everyone must know now. Yeah, that's what I want. From your description, over the phone. I can't draw, so, yeah. Linda has Lyle go to his laptop and sign him in as a co-worker. Linda is emotionless, all business. So much so, Lyle wonders if maybe he's on the spectrum. As Lyle describes his vivid memories of Jewel's face, astonishingly, she begins to take form on his own laptop. A heart-shaped face, haunted, cold, dark eyes staring out, a tattered Victorian dress. The more details, Linda adds, the more Lyle's blood pressure seems to rise. She's becoming Jewel. And Lyle wonders, what if just seeing her image could restore more strength and feelings to his legs? Linda makes Lyle choose a girlish, age-appropriate Victorian dress, but Lyle knows it's wrong and objects. Why would she dress as a grown woman? You're a cop. Young girl in a whorehouse in the 1880s. Oh. But she still looks too old. Why? That's the grown-up Victorian hairdo you chose. Well, that's how she looked. But how do you know she's just 12? I don't know. I, I just know. Okay. Well... There's head-to-body ratio. The younger the child, the bigger the head. Linda tries various head sizes until Jules' head matches up well with the gaunt shoulders Lyle recalls. That's it, Lyle exclaims, now over the moon that he can see the girl, sort of, when he wants. Linda adds some shading, including distressing the dress a bit and emails the finished image, reminding Lyle that he never did this artwork. It's on Lyle's smartphone, too. Linda shares it with just one techie friend and opens Pandora's box. But Lyle is unaware of this. Back in bed, he drifts gratefully off to sleep, unusual for a guy who's been anesthetizing himself with scotch for years. Then came his car crash, and then his meds. And he dreams, pleasant at first, an idyll in which doting dad Lyle plays with young curly-haired Georgie. Except, even in a dream, Lyle knows he was never the doting type. The dreams turn darker. Verbal clashes with his wife, Belinda, the blameless local girl who married the up-and-coming lawyer. While she was undergoing cancer treatment, Belinda knew Lyle was untrue to her. That dream turns nightmarish when he looks in a mirror and Newt Gingrich is grinning back. Then, a vision of Jewel. She seems alive until she's dragged back into the old house. Struggling with some unseen force, Lyle understands she wants him to hear the cries of the women inside the house, hear their torment as she disappears behind old Vic's door. Sleeping Lyle is rocked by screams and unexpected visions of violence. A large kitchen knife gripped by a small hand rises and slashes the air. Crimson blood spurts in all directions. Jewel reappears. Now she seems quiet, unfocused. Seated against a wall, she stares at Lyle blindly. There's more. Not just the girl's head and shoulders, 
Lyle can see she's holding something wrapped in a ragged cloth. A baby. Glad to be free from the horrors of unrestful sleep, Lyle is treated to a fresh horror outside. More strangers on his property. Some are the aluminum foil hat type, some Age of Aquarius types, some the plastic bin-banging occupied type. Many are chanting. I saw her face. I'm a believer. Sure enough, there are two or three TV remote trucks down the block. One news crew has a reporter on camera interviewing one of the campers. They now call themselves believers. They are a few cops too, but still. Then an old horror, Fraser Newton is calling. Lyle does not have the bandwidth to deal with his ball-busting former partner, but picks up. Oh, my old friend Lyle, and I do mean old. Fraser. I knew you were listing sideways the other day in my office, but geez, Lyle. First, you're being kindly to Dar Hall, and now wading balls deep into a crisis of your own making. Fraser, what do you want? Are you keeping up with current events? Trying not to. Is your driver going to get you to your court appearance this morning? Lyle is shocked, but tries to hide it. Yeah, he completely forgot. I... today. This morning, Lyle. Do you use email? Or your phone? Or do you just get emanations from a higher plane? I've been busy. Yeah, saw your write-up. Mose Allen finally got the interview with you he's always wanted. And now we know how he really feels. Fraser... There are so many moving parts in this. Lyle breaks off from mentioning daughter Georgie. Right, moving parts. Well, I'd get my paralyzed ass down to justice court ASAP, Lyle. Sloane is presiding, and you know he does not suffer fools gladly. And Becky Tuttle is now involved. Sloan, huh? Becky Tuttle, Lyle. Save a barn, your old nemesis? She's on Channel 12 now outside the courthouse with a reporter. Not bad looking. Does she have work done? I have so many nemeses. Even Gertie at the Greasy Spoon serves me the superheated coffee. Gertie, too? You know how to pick them. Channel 12 is really milking this. They're showing your wacky followers convening outside the courthouse, chanting. I like the ones who paint their faces. Are any going topless? Just the men. Now they're showing Moses' photos from last night. You and the weird priest. Out behind old Vic, are you? Now there's a shot of you shouting and giving Moe's the finger. Nice. Lyle does not remember that particular gesture, but does remember the moment. A gross intrusion on his privacy, despite his trespassing on Southampton town property. They've blurred out the finger itself, saving youngsters from corruption. Still, I can't imagine Detective Georgie not seeing this. Is there a good part to this call, Fraser? Yeah, me hanging up. Now remember, you have no affiliation with my business. None whatsoever. No matter what they ask you, it's critical that your madness doesn't rub off on me. You have a business. boy. I'll be watching on TV. I'd wish you luck, but all you can hope to achieve now is damage control. <laughs> Thanks for your words of encouragement. My ass is not paralyzed. Gotta run. Stay crazy. Putting his phone away, he stares out the window at the throng. Believers, huh? Then he's smacked with a thought. Becky Tuttle. She's the gal who used to team with Noah Craig when they were trying to preserve old homes in court. Homes, old farms Lyle and Fraser were buying to resell to McMansion developers. She and Lyle had a kind of love-hate relationship over the years. From Lyle's perspective, divorcee Becky was attractive, in her prim Barbara Billingsley style, despite the dagger eyes she'd make at him during court proceedings. Becky, huh? Lyle calls Fred for a ride to Justice Court and cleans himself up while waiting for his driver to negotiate the crowd around his house. In the mirror, he gets his hair under control and appears passable. At least Newt Gingrich isn't looking back at him. Throwing on a navy blazer helps, and he opts for his wheelchair. That may evoke sympathy. Not from Sloane, of course. That old bat never liked Lyle's arrogance. 
maybe the media, or Becky Tuttle. Outside now, Fred is trying to back up closer to Lyle's front yard. The van's beep, beep, beep reverse warning cuts through the crowd noise as Lyle opens his door. Fred helped Lyle into his van ambulance and folded the wheelchair for the ride to Southampton. He had to be patient working through the crowd of campers. They'd seen Lyle and crowded around the van like iron filings, their faces, some painted, pressed up against the windows. More organized now, the believers chant energetically. Fred pulling away at last, Lyle could sense frustration in the group. For all the trouble they'd gone to, this rich lawyer wasn't giving them anything back. Maybe Lyle was not their friend, not on their side. After a 20-minute drive, Fred and Lyle encounter a new restive crowd and more TV news trucks outside the courthouse. Scope's monkey trial, Lyle says under his breath. He sees at a distance some of them waving copies of a sign at cameras. There's a face pictured on it. From his angle, the face curiously strikes Lyle as Che Guevara. Fred maneuvers to the back entrance of the courthouse. Lyle used to call it the Alec Baldwin entrance, as it was out of sight for most celebrity seekers, except Mose Allen. He pops up as if on cue as Lyle lowers himself into his chair. Lyle Hall, a few questions. Haven't you done enough, Mose? People want to know. Are you going to purchase Old Vic? Where will Jewel go if they demolish the place? Will you occupy the house yourself to stop the wrecking ball? Would Jewel stay with you? That's what the believers want. And what are you doing about Save a Barn? Fred, escorting Lyle to the courthouse back door, gets it open and Lyle, his head swirling, rolls himself inside to face yet another crowd. Lots of people. Some recognize Lyle Hall, others are absorbed in their own conversations. Some are on their smartphones, some point theirs at the man of the hour. Lyle makes his way into the courtroom proper, and there's another shock. The room is jam-packed. It's mostly Hampton's real estate people Lyle recognizes, his former competitors, including a two-row contingent of sales ladies and two men, all sporting their trademark all-white outfits. Heads turn to face Lyle, and his discomfort turns to flop sweat as an ominous murmur rises around him. In the gallery above are lots of believers. They're seated, but seem unruly and ready for a show. Then a new shock. Those signs he saw outside, some people brandish them upstairs too. They aren't Che Guevara. They are Jewel. Someone made Linda's drawing of the ghost girl public. Emotions roiling through him, Lyle succeeds in taking his place before the bench. Through the fog, he notes the presence of Becky Tuttle and her lawyers seated to his right and making matters worse. Suddenly, the room goes silent. All rise, bellows the bailiff, and Judge Sloan, bald eagle head, granny glasses, black robe, sweeps in and takes his place at the bench. Eyeing the unusual crowd, he gavels court into session and peers down with his customary scowl at seated Lyle Hall. Mr. Hall, are you prepared at this time to proceed with proof of the historical significance of designation of the property at 111 Poplar Street in Bridgehampton? Lyle now recalls Sloan's machine gun delivery. Lyle Hall is not on his game. Not yet. No, Your Honor. I, we... Let the record show the plaintiff is not prepared to proceed with proof. Mr. Hall, there is only one way this court will consider any new motion for injunction against demolition of the house on this property, given the apparent lack of historical status. Plaintiff, that's you, must file a new motion including an affidavit stating that the house and property on which it is located is to be purchased for the sole purpose of title owner occupancy, provided it is brought into full compliance with the town code. The crowd is hushed and the judge winces down at Lyle as he continues. Not to flip the property in a business transaction, but to move in and live there upon such condition. Now, Mr. Hall, can you tell this court that you would purchase and occupy that property and house and bring it into full compliance? There is not a sound in the courtroom. Your Honor, I would. Suddenly, a collective gasp, and Sloan raps his gavel three times. 
Lyle reminds himself of the old days when he could think on his feet. I would if I could, Your Honor. But in light of recent events, I must wholeheartedly stress to this court that the structure and property be preserved for an agreed-upon reasonable period of time for academic study and research. Following such period, I agree that the structure should be raised. There, fervent yet threading the needle, the old Lyle. However, waves of whispers roll across the courtroom. Sloan gavels four times. Mr. Hall, you're appearing before this court today at great expense to the town of Southampton rather than simply filing a letter withdrawing your original motion. Your Honor, the situation is fluid. If you saw what's become of my home recently... A situation you wholly brought upon yourself. So now you will be at odds with your only ally in this case. Uh, ally in this case? Ally in this case? Gobsmacked, Lyle is at a loss for words. Who could be his ally? Mr. Hall, as you're surely aware, the historical building preservation organization Save a Barn has joined in your application to stave off demolition. Save a Barn, Becky. Lyle's temples pound and his ears turn red as the spectators mutter. Maybe he should check his phone more frequently. Becky Tuttle's eyes are boring into him. He sneaks a bug-eyed peek at her. She's pissed. Lyle turns to Judge Sloan. Your Honor... I must respectfully withdraw my motion to enjoin demolition. Another gasp from the attendees, and disruption from the upper deck. Quiet in this court! He looks down at Lyle and then over to Becky. Then I'm prepared to rule now. In light of the plaintiff's statement on the record today, plaintiff's motion shall be marked withdrawn. The house at 111 Poplar, posing a danger to the community, will be demolished by the town without further delay. Lyle deflates. Not what he'd hoped for. There's more muttered crowd reaction. The campers seated in the rafters stamp their feet five times in unison, a la I'm a believer. Quiet in the court! However, the adjacent barn, given the motion filed with this court by the Save a Barn organization, will remain standing pending a full hearing at which said organization shall have to prove the structure's significance to our region's farming heritage. Sloan briefly scowls out over his granny glasses at the assembled crowd. Any such preservation will be contingent upon the collection of sufficient funds to pay for the barn's renovation and upkeep as an educational and historic site. In addition, the organization will enhance the property with the construction of a child-safe preschool playground adjacent to the barn. Such hearing will be in 30 days. Judge Sloan cracks the sound block with his gavel. The bailiff cries, all rise. As Sloan makes his way back to chambers, the court erupts into chaos. Everyone is in motion, except Lyle, sitting alone and deflated before the bench in his wheelchair. A few voices upstairs defiantly chant, I'm a believer. Lyle is now their opponent. His eyes meet Becky's. He tries to read her expression. Haughty victory over Lyle. Yeah, smug. Definitely. Lyle realizes he kind of likes her haughtiness. She succeeded. She turned the tables on Lyle Hall. His thoughts are racing so fast. Jewel, daughter Georgie, his own house. This fear comes stuff. But he settles on the bassist instinct, the tight fit of Becky Tuttle's cashmere sweater set. Fred's van is waiting. Most of the crowd and most of the TV reporters are out front talking, chanting, reporting. But not all. Rolling toward the safety of the ambulance, Lyle spots Flo Hendricks hurrying toward him. In broad daylight, she's what Lyle would call a big girl, though the term is probably verboten nowadays. Behind her, a fancy black van is pulled up. Clearly marked fear comp, there are other people standing by the van, all in black clothing. Flo is wearing a dark grey suit and her pearl choker. She blocks his path. Lyle, that was eventful. Did you see us inside? No, I was a little busy. You do understand what went on was out of your control, right? Lyle rolls his eyes and tries to make out who else is with Flo. From now on, we control the narrative, you understand? You should have had us take you to court and support you in the hearing. 
Are you all lawyers, too? We don't let you get caught unawares like that. You remember signing with us last night, right? Lyle remembers the 8x10 of that reporter, Silk. Vaguely. Well, no matter now. It's time to get to work. You're coming with us. Lyle cringes. Fred sticks his head out of the driver's window. Coming with? I don't think so. I've got enough problems. So you're a lawyer and you don't read the contract you signed? I could, but I'd have to invoice you. Lyle, come. The next phase in your rehabilitation awaits. Lyle is thinking my My rehabilitation rehabilitation as Flo steps aside, allowing a clear view of the Fearcom team. A pair of young men in black t-shirts and jeans are standing around waiting for him. And someone else commands his attention, in part because she's paying him no attention. Silk, on her phone.